when somebody does something uh, nice for you uh, and you don't, I mean, if you know them, you should probably tell them thank you, right? And if you don't know them, you probably should really say thanks, correct? So, um, so I don't know how you were raised, but, you know, I was raised to open doors for women, uh, especially my wife, make sure, you know, I open the door for her to get her in the car and stuff like that. So when Liz and I were out shopping the other day, uh, you know, uh, in California, there's just one door to get into a store, but we had to get used to going through two doors uh, because of weather. Uh, and so, you know, I was going through the double door thing with my wife and going into Macy's or something. And, and so, you know, so I opened the door for Liz, Liz went in and there was another lady standing there, uh, you know, waiting to come out. And so instead of me stepping in, you know, in front of her, what's, what's a man to do? Hold the door open for her. So, you know, so I did, you know, I, I just stepped to the side and just held the door open for her, and she just shot by me and kept going. Hey, <laughs> don't you ever want to like stop and say something? You know, like your carnal ego kind of wants to step in and go, hey, what do you think you're doing? I just held the door open for you. I'm supposed to say, thank you. I've actually done that before. Um, have you done? Uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm not perfect. I never said I was perfect. Uh, it's, that's the former wrestler mentality in me from high school. It's like, what? It's really bad when, I've had this happen too, when the, the lady goes by and her husband goes by. I've had that happen. It's like, hey, buddy, we need to have a talk. My mom taught me. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I'm just saying. Uh, but the Christian thing to do is, you know, hold the door, let the person go by, et cetera. So I was at the little gas station down here uh, by Safeway on the corner, right here in Oki Mill, Lee Chapel. You go in there. I was in there the other morning early coming to church, almost out of gas, pulled in. Uh, There's a line, uh, what's new? And I, I was waiting to get gas, and the, the next pump over was a guy in a big truck, so I couldn't see around him. Um, and uh, I don't know the guy. Uh, and he starts, you know, waving at me and everything. I'm like, hey, what's up? And, <laughs> and he's like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pump over there. And I, so I, you know, looked over there. I'm like, whoa, there is a free pump over there. Uh, so I backed up and, you know, and then rolled my window down and said, thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's awesome. That's what you're supposed to do, right? So look at it this way. If you're supposed to say thanks to people when they do nice things for you, then what should you do toward God? Did you, did you hear me? If you say, you're supposed to say thanks to people that you can see, should you not say thanks to God whom you cannot see, but you can see the things that he does? Thanks. Uh, Israel uh, was um, called to give thanks to God. Uh, and this particular psalm is an illustration. When they came to word, worship or their version of church, this psalm uh, taught them the importance of saying thanks to God. I mean, how many times does God do things for us and we absolutely just take him for granted? This psalm drills into your head that it's most important for you to give thanks to him. And we haven't covered one of these types of psalms. This is a psalm where uh, you have statements and then you have a repetitive statement. So he's, he's going to say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That steadfast love endures forever is an antiphonal response, meaning uh, the worship leader would say the first line and the congregation surrounding the temple would say the second line. That's an antiphonal response. You understand? Okay, so we're, we're going to give this a shot. See how Jewish you are this morning. Shalom, you ready? Bokor Tov is Hebrew for good morning, so hopefully you're, you're ready. You ready? Okay, so what's going to happen here? I'm going to say the first line, and you're going to say, for his loving kindness is everlasting, right? Right? We're on the same page? Okay. So give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. <laughs> Guys are professional worshipers. Uh, give thanks to the Lord, uh, God of gods. I think there's more. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. There's still more. Uh, to him who alone does great wonders. To him who made the heavens with skill. I mean, we could go on and on. Could we not? I mean, if you really thought about it, you could go on and on. Now, imagine if you've got thousands of worshipers gathered around you know, the massive temple on that 24 acres of inlaid Solomonic rock, the white sun glistening you know, on the stones and everything, and, you, and you can, as you're approaching uh, you know, worship, as you're coming in through the subterranean Hulda gates and coming down onto the temple platform and seeing it all, what are you hearing as you're walking through the tunnels, as it were, to the temple platform? Hearing this, for his love endures forever. Uh, do you remember that, that God's love endures forever? 
Uh, this particular psalm teaches us about the importance of public praise. So praise should be twofold. It should be in private because there's probably some things God does in your life you just don't want to share with other people. That's the way I look at it. He's, he's my best friend. He's my Lord. He's my guide. But some of the stuff he does is just personal between me and him. And then there's other things that you want to just make sure everybody knows about. Uh, there's awesome things that he's done. Uh, and, and so you praise him for those. Those would be public praise. And so uh, praise is the, both of those, private and public. Today, it's all about public praise. Uh, and so we want to look at public praise. It should be how we live our lives is looking for opportunity to praise the Lord. So structurally, the way this uh, passage is put together, uh, first in verses one to three is what I would call a call to thanks. It's really a command because there's four Hebrew commands for you to do this. So giving thanks to God is not a suggestion. Uh, it's a command from God. Uh, verses four through 25 is the cause of thanks or the reason that you would give thanks. And since that's the majority of the passage, you can say that the emphasis of the passage is on giving God the exact reasons why you praise him. And then he's going to close uh, with a call to thanks again in verse 26. So I told you this before, as we've analyzed other Psalms, I'll tell you it again. When you start and you finish with the same motif, that's called inclusio. It's like tying a bow on a, on a package. I mean, what would a package be without the beautiful bow? And so he, he says, when you think about praising God, uh, think about the beautiful package or the reasons you're going to tell God you're praising him. But, but remember, it's a command to do it. Uh, last week, I likened it to a hamburger, correct? I don't know how well that went over for you. The second service had a really hard time approaching lunch. But, um, but the middle meat is what God wants to know. Are you paying attention to what I'm doing in your life? Now, let's get real. I got a couple cool questions to ask you. Are you a thankful person? I mean, are you really thankful? Are you, really, are you the guy that blows by me when I open the door? Uh, or you know, are you the one that stops and says thanks? Are you really a thankful person? And then secondly, I would ask you, as we, as we move through this passage, and we're not covering the whole passage today. It's going to take us two weeks. Um, second is a real important question. What, what things would you praise God for? If you sat down today after lunch and came up with a list, you, if you're single, or if you're a widow or widower, or if you're married with kids, whatever, what would be the list that you would thank God for, exactly, that his mercy would be seen in your life. So think about those things. Now, we could say that in a given week, there's a lot to be depressed about. You're so depressed you can't even talk. I mean, wouldn't you agree? I mean, you just read the news and it's like, what else can happen, right? So I'm just gonna click down through the things that are depressing to just get them off the plate for just a second. Don't get depressed by the list, okay? Do not criticize my list. These are just the things that make you not want to give thanks, all right? Should I get the jab or not get the jab? You got to be kidding me. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, oh, what's my American right to do what I want, right? My body, my choice, you know? What happened to that? All the arguments, pro and con, etc. cetera. Uh, our pastoral staff has been heavily engaged with helping you write letters uh, to get exempted, et cetera. We're all there to help you. But it's a huge question, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I hear constantly, I'm going to lose my job if I don't do this, or I, I'm not going to get promoted, or they're going to wash me out of the Navy, or whatever. So should I get the jab or not? That's depressing. Um, with so many ships parked off of L.A., no Christmas. I keep telling my wife, better buy now. You know, there might not be anything when, you know, because all the ships are off. Oh, you're kidding me. Um, with so many nurses and doctors not getting the job and losing their jobs, if I were to have a heart attack at 63, is anyone going to be there? I told you it was depressing. Um, I'm flying in uh, two weeks to do a, uh, I'm going to suffer for God in West Palm Beach. Uh, I have to go down there and do a wedding. That's going to be rough. Now I'm wondering, I'm flying Southwest Air. <laughs> Why do you laugh at me? Um, so I'm thinking to myself, is there going to be a plane? Because last week they had a massive weather event that affected the airlines. I'm thinking, really? Anyway, that's a whole other subject. Um, and then I've got, we've got our enemies, the, the Chinese, flying hundreds of sorties over Taiwan in their airspace. This is unnerving. This is depressing. What should a Christian be doing? Thinking about those things all the time going, it's over, man. It's totally over. Uh, no, you should be thankful, right? Thank, so I'm saying, park the negative stuff, okay? You just parked it? You just parked it? Four people are still, yeah, I'm still hung up on the jab thing. Get back to the sermon. 
Okay, park the negative stuff, get to the positive. So what does God want you to really be doing in the middle of all the negativity? Giving him thanks, giving him thanks. So let's get into it. We're gonna look at the call of thanks in verses one to three, the positive side of the Christian life. So here's what he says, it's pretty simple. Give thanks to the Lord, why? It's a prepositional phrase denoting the reason, Uh, because he's good. Uh, For his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, Uh, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, why? Well, the prepositional phrase says, well, his loving kindness is everlasting. We want to analyze this. Uh, First, the first imperative uh, to give thanks uh, focuses on giving thanks to the covenantal name of God that we've covered many times in our year-long study of the Psalter. So this is capital L-O-R-D. You should absolutely know what this is in Hebrew at this point. It's Yahweh. It's Yahweh. What's so big about that name? Well, that's, that's the name of God. I mean, that's the Genesis 3, 14, or Exodus 3, 14 to 15 name that God gave Moses when Moses said, I, I got to have a name to go to Israel to tell them I talk to you. And he says, well, I'm the I am. It's a derivative of that. It's the great covenantal name of God. So if you read, which I did this week, uh, if you read the Hebrew text of Genesis 12, 1 to 3, uh, chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, verse 6, 7, 8, etc., all throughout those great covenantal passages between God establishing a covenant Uh, with Abraham to bless the world with the coming of the Messiah, uh, he uses uh, Yahweh. Well, he's the covenantal God. And since it's tied to the concept of the verb to be, well, then he's always going to be there for you. He will never renege on on his covenant with you. And it says here, you should worship this kind of God, which we studied more in detail last week. He ontologically always is outside of time and space, and he's transcendent yet imminent. Talk about awesome. It says that he's good. So I was reading through this when I was studying this week, and I asked myself the simple question. Good in what way? I mean, is God good? So let's think about it. Uh, so good. So is good God good when he gives you a job? You would say, hallelujah, yes. Uh, but how about when he does something negative in your life? Is he still good? Yes, because he's, he's sovereign. So think about Joseph. Uh, his brothers didn't like him. Remember Joseph? They didn't like him because God was making preeminent. They all got jealous. So what did they do? Sibling rivalry rivalry kicked in, and they just threw his body in a pit and then left him for the Ishmaelites to pick up. Talk about a bad day. Talk about a dysfunctional family. And we know the Ishmaelites picked him up and took him to Egypt, and you know the whole story, you know, et cetera. So he winds up in prison because he's accused of of a sex crime he didn't commit by Potiphar's wife, a politician. He eventually rises to being second in command of Egypt. He was strategically placed there, why? Because God knew a famine was coming and that all of his family would be forced to leave Canaan land and come down to Egypt. And who would be in command of the nation to help them with the food problem? Their brother. So what did God do? He took a desperate situation, a terrible situation, and said, I'm gonna take the adversity, I'm gonna turn it into something awesome. You gotta look at that and go, oh, God is good. He's wise, and boy, is he good. He's good even in the hard times. Such is the way that he he exists. Hebrews chapter 12, verse two says this about Uh, difficulties. It says, we are fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of the faith. This phrase here is mind-boggling. Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That's unbelievable. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, who for joy set before him endured the cross. Who would say that the cross, Roman crucifixion, would be that which you would look for joyfully. Well, Jesus did. Why? Because Jesus knew he was going to defeat sin and death on that cross and be able to provide salvation for sinners who could enjoy heaven with him because of his sacrifice. You see what I mean? So when it says, uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, that means that he's, he's good whether your plan of your life is going awesome or you're wondering what happened. And this week I was talking to my mom who moved here uh, a year ago, and she's actually... I mean, I mean, she came here at 80. I don't think she's here. We can talk about her. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe she moved here from California. I mean, it's awesome to have my mom near, near us. But, you know, I was talking to her this week. She's totally become a Virginian. I mean, she, she loves the weather. She loves the snow. She loves the rain. I'm like, where have you come from? But anyway, uh, <laughs> so we were talking this week. because, Oh, mom, hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm probably going to, you know, probably disinherited at this point. But anyway, (laughs) anyway, so I was talking to my mom this week about my dad, who was a federal agent in charge of hundreds of agents and on the border. So my whole life, he was guarding the border. And I told my mom this week, after studying the border and what's going on with the border, because there kind of isn't no border, 
Uh, and my dad started with the Border Patrol and then went to U.S. Customs and all the stuff he did to protect us from tunnels and all the things he used to shut down uh, until he passed away uh, in 08. I, I told my mom this week, is not God good that, that he took my dad when he did from brain cancer? That I can look at brain cancer, as hideous as that was, as hard as that was to watch him pass into God's presence, we were all with him. It was a hard thing to watch, but in the wisdom of God, uh, my dad, who had also had a bad heart, I told my mom, all of this would have killed him as a federal agent. It would, it, it would actually, he could not have handled it. And so I look at it, and I have to say, God, you are most good because you took my father before this all unwound, uh, and he could not have processed this. It's the wisdom of God, is it not? So God is good, and because he's good, his loving kindness endures forever. And mom, hopefully you, you'll understand and remember to be loving and kind. Thank you, after. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> She actually moves. She never sits over there. Oh, okay, great. She's like, are you getting introduced as a new member? Oh, okay. Anyway, so, sorry for the personal conversation. Um, so it says that his, uh, his loving kindness is everlasting. So loving kindness is the Hebrew word chesed. Uh, you got to have a kind of a guttural spitting kind of sound when you make it because there's two Hebrew words or let, letters for H. One has a guttural sound, one doesn't. Uh, chesed means God's loyal, unshakable love. You cannot get rid of it, which means his love for you, uh, will, he will never desert you. His love's not going anywhere. He won't let go of you. Uh, he'll never be looking the other way, that he will be with you no matter what. Do you believe it? It's easy to believe that when things are going well, but when you're looking at things going south, you're thinking, where's God? Uh, yeah, he didn't go anywhere. Why? His love endures forever. And it says that uh, we should thank him because there's no other God like him. There's no other God like him. So he's also called the God of gods. And what's interesting is the Hebrew word for God is Elohim. That's another name. In fact, that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Uh, but the word for, like, false gods is Elelim. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Why? Because a false god is just a few degrees off center of truth. Because if you're a few degrees off center off of a compass and you're on a 3,000-mile hike... <laughs> You get to the end of the journey, you're going to be way off course. No, he says he's the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. And so what he's not saying uh, is that God is the head of all known pantheons and they're gods and he's the head God. He's not saying that. And I know he's not saying that because uh, Isaiah 43 says this. God says, you, Israel, are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Uh, and, and my servant whom I have chosen in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Uh, the he's not really there in the Hebrew text. That's added to make sense in, an e in English. He just says profoundly, I'm the I am. And by the way, this is a whole other thing, but when Jesus comes along in John 8, 58, and says before Abraham was, I am, the ego e me, uh, ego is the first person pronoun in the Greek, and e me is the first person, a copula, the verb to be. Jesus makes an equation with this statement, because that statement, I am he in Hebrew, is anihu. That's the Hebrew version of ego me. When Jesus came along and said, oh, you want to know who I am? I'm the I am. They tried to stone him. Why? He just blasphemed in their perspective. Why? He claimed to be God. Anyway, back to my sermon. That was extra. Um, God says, there's, there's no other one beside me. So he said, you can take any God of any pantheon, El, the God of the Canaanites, uh, Baal, Ra of the Egyptian, Zeus. Uh, you can take any ancient God in any pantheon, and I'm not just... I'm not just over that. They're not even comparable to me because I'm the living God and there are no gods. And he said, you could take any modern version of God. It could be Allah. It could be Buddha. It could be, you pick any other, uh, any other deity system. And he says, they're off center of truth. I am the God, the living God. I am the only God. And besides me, he said, there is none after me. No gods after me. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad that I'm with a God who will never forsake me. That's what, that's what he says in Hebrews 13, 3. He says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age in Matthew 28, 20. And then in Hebrews 13, 5, Jesus says, I will ne never desert you, and I will never forsake you. I've been forsaken by friends over the years. It's painful. It's a hard thing to process. When you're deserted by a friend, it, it cuts deep because you never saw it coming. Jesus will look at you and say, I don't care what happens. I ain't leaving you. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, the, that's the call to thanks. Then we want to get into the cause of thanks, and it's been two weeks looking at this, the cause of thanks. Uh, why, you, why you should be praising God. So remember I gave you an assignment to ask yourself, am I thankful? And number two, 
what would I exactly tell God I'm thankful for? So let's analyze it. He says, uh, I'm going to call this a snapshot or exhibit number one. If you're an attorney, you'll enjoy this. Exhibit one to prove your case uh, that God should be praised. He says in verse four, to him who alone does great wonders for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day for his loving kindness is everlasting. And the moon and the stars to rule by night, well, his loving kindness is everlasting. Think about this. This is just the first section. And you can divide up all these into little tiny paragraphs because each little section has its own little motif. So snapshot number one, he's, he's looking at cosmic things. He said, if you can't think of anything to praise God for, look around, look up. And if you look up, uh, you'll find much to praise God for as you look at the great wonder of the cosmos. Uh, I grew up in the deserts of Southern California uh, where there was little light refraction and you could really see the stars. I mean, I remember going outside as a kid and you could sit and watch satellites go over. I mean, just you could see clearly in the desert. And this is a picture of a California desert. Uh, just the, you know, you can just see one of the arms of, like, of, the, of the Milky Way. It's just awesome, isn't it? And who can look at that when you're out there camping and go, eh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, where's the s'mores? Because uh, I've been with people like this before. No, 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 no. Check it out. This is the, it's like the finger of God. So he says, if you want to look about things to praise God for, well, look at, look at the fact that God does great wonders, like in the creation of our cosmos. I mean, you think about uh, our polar axis tilt is 23.5 degrees. So we have kind of like a, a wobble as a planet. Well, did, God, did God mess up? No, no, I'm glad he did, because it gives us the seasons that my mother loves here in Virginia. Because without that, we wouldn't have the beautiful season. So, so now that it, I, I went out this morning to get in the car, and I'm like, whoa, it's cold. Praise God. I, I don't like humidity, but I know what's coming. Frigid. I have to really think, work on thanking God for that part of the world. But, uh, but, but, but all that's part of the greatness and the wonder of God, just the seasons based on the tilt of the planet. Uh, to, t to travel across the Milky Way galaxy, traveling at the speed of light would take 100,000 years. How fast is light? 35 miles an hour, yeah. 186,000 miles per what? Second. And it's gonna take 100,000 years to go across the cosmos? I mean, our, our version, little, our little galaxy, and we're one of millions of galaxies? And is there anybody else out there? Well, not from what we can see. It's just us. And you say, well, God, I just don't have anything to thank you for. I mean, things are falling apart, and it's so depressing. And God's like, look up. Look up. I mean, who can't study the heavens and conclude, as God did, that they were, they were fashioned by the hand of God? He fashioned them by his hand. Not by evolution, by his hand. I mean, divine skill and love, love fashioned our dynamic universe. What's, what's prevalent in our universe that God fashioned in his love for us? Rotation. Rotation. I mean, rotation is prevalent all throughout our cosmos, and rotation creates on our planet the day-night cycle. Uh, it's just the way that it is. And without rotation, we'd not have gra gravity, and we'd have a real problem, would we not? We couldn't even be meeting for church. I mean, gravity is a wonderful thing. Where did all that come from? The hand of God, the loving hand of God. He says, I'm going to make you a planet to live on, and it's going to have the right rotation so that you can have gravity and you can live on that planet. I mean, divine skill and love placed 100 billion magnificent stars in our galaxy. Amazing, amazing. The distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles. You, you think about it. However smart you are, how many degrees are behind your name, you can't process that. Who can? I mean, it's mind-boggling. I've had people even break it down into analogies, and they're like, I don't get the analogy. You know, it's, just, it's just beyond my mind. I mean, it's just, this is what God does. He, he puts all these things out there, and there's no way that's out there by chance because explosions don't pr produce perfect locations of things. They destroy it. Didn't you blow up stuff as a child? Et cetera. Divine skill and love brought the land that we enjoy out of the water so you have a wonderful place to live. I mean, true? I mean, think about our, our world. I mean, if you're a surfer, who wouldn't want to be on that wave? Where? In the middle of the tube. Man, just going for it. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, think about the water. I mean, our, our planet is 71% water with an average depth of 12,100 feet. So 98% of all the water on the planet is located in the oceans. So we have a little bit of spit of land to live on, and God's like, I made it perfect, perfect. Just enough water, salt and fresh water, for you to live on this planet, and the landscape is going to be awesome. Not by chance. See, I was thinking about it this week. I was sitting in my chair studying. I'm thinking, man, I am so glad I don't live on Venus. Men are from Mars. <laughs> yeah, what's Venus like? Well, let's, uh, let's dig into it. Uh, Venus is called Earth's twin sister because of size and shape. But two-thirds of the planet's surface is flat. Flat. Uh, it's smooth planes. Uh, and because they have an, a negative greenhouse effect there, uh, it traps the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, so it's a, it's a temperature of 870 degrees on any given day. <laughs> Wonderful. And man, don't be thinking, man, I'm glad I'm not on Venus because Mars has no better. You know, so aren't you glad when you look around these planets, you think, God, from that strategic explosion, when you created everything and you positioned everything to be where it was and you spun everything into rotation and you put the little moons in rotation around their planets and everything, I mean, it's like perfect. And we just happen to be on an outer arm of the, of the Milky Way galaxy where it's on the outer edge as it spins throughout the universe. It's dark where we are so we can see stars. If he put us closer to the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, we couldn't see. Oh, it was just by accident. <laughs> now nah, I don't believe that. Perfectly placed so that we can see, and thank God that we're on this planet and not Venus, correct? Yeah. A divine skill and love gave us the great light we call the sun. Uh, it's 93 million miles from our planet, but aren't you glad that it's there? Divine massive placement, and the love of God is in the placement of the sun. Because if it was further away from us, what would happen? freeze. If it was closer, fry. You want a suntan? Takes about two seconds. Just step outside, <laughs> etc. I'm just saying. So I look at these things and I think, man, man, how great God is. I mean, we are perfectly placed where he wants us to be. Uh, and this particular sun produces just enough light uh, so that we, we don't get all burned up uh, and that the plants do what they're supposed to do with that photosynthesis thing, right? I mean, I'm a gardener. I love plants. It just blows me away to watch them, you know, in the spring when all the bulbs pop out and the you know, rose bushes, the knockout roses are just popping out the roses and, you know, the peonies are blue. I mean, it's just, I'm just in wonder at, at the artistic nature of God. Uh, and all this is because of the sun being where God placed it to be. And because the sun, you know, generates the, the, the light to help the plants grow, then they produce the oxygen that we can breathe. And it's like primo. And this did not happen by chance because the psalmist says, praise God because in his greatness, he hung all those things there for you. So if you have nothing to thank God for, thank him for that. And speaking of the sun, since I'm, you know, spent 50 years of my life in California, I like the sun. In fact, that was why they had to burn my face off twi twice last year, literally, because of cancer. Uh, but, you know, every time I went in there, they're like, oh, like oh, how can I stop this from happening? Uh, you can't because this all happened when you were, before you were 18. Great, because I lived in the sun in California. Uh, but I am a living illustration of vitamin D, right? Don't you like vitamin D? Because it comes from ultraviolet rays. What does vitamin D do for your body? Um, let's analyze this. Uh, vitamin D, um, coveted vitamin, uh, it, it helps you absorb calcium, modulates your cell growth, helps your immune system function, and helps reduce inflammation. Uh, if you don't have enough vitamin D, uh, well, your bones begin to thin out. Uh, they become brittle and crooked. So if you want to fix your bone structure, hey, lawn chair time, get outside. Uh, thank God for those sunny days, especially like when it gets cold here and you take a trip to Florida. You know, it's 15 degrees here and you're down there. And you're like, oh, this feels so good. I mean, who can't sit in the chair by the pool and go, this is awesome. You don't leave. You stay here. Uh, it's vitamin D. That's what you're getting. You need more of that. Divine skill and love gave us our moon, which is amazing. I mean, think about the moon. Now, some people, you know, last night we were driving home uh, from dinner and it was, the clouds were moving really fast over us and you could see the moon, you know, rising and it was bright, but it was behind like a thin band of, of clouds and it was illuminating the clouds. It was like, cool. So I told my wife as I'm driving, oh, check it out. The, check out the moon. I mean, the moon. Now, a lot of people look up and go, oh yeah, whatever. It's the moon. I love the moon. I mean, you think about the moon. Don't be the kind of person who's like, yeah, that's great, but hey, th there's a World Series game tonight. 
And by the way, how about those Dodgers? <laughs> anyway, just saying. Anyway, back to my real sermon. Uh, yeah, it is God's team. They got blue. Just saying. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, and did I stay up and watch all the games this week? Are you out of your mind? There's no way. Yeah, because I wouldn't be preaching this morning. I'd be a zombie. Uh, because you think about the mood and how wonderful it is. I mean, God has placed it there. Uh, it is so perfect that it is there. Where it is placed, it creates tidal action. I mean, if there was no moon, surfers, well, <laughs> try to find a wave. You know, I mean, it is what it is. But if there was no moon, uh, go, uh, you can just go throughout science and figure out how great the moon is to the planet. I'll give you a case in point. This is called a Mormon uh, tea plant. It's a little picture. See that? That's a Mormon tea plant. Uh, that could not pollinate if there's no moon. Because what this little uh, particular plant does, uh, uh, at the end of each of, of all those little red, uh, looks like flowers, they're not really a flower per se, but they're like little, little droplets and will form on those. And at nighttime, it's like a disco ball. The, the moon rays hit all these little droplets that are on these little flowering things because this, this plant can't pollinate. And how it pollinates is it produces these little droplets and then it shines in the moonlight and it flickers and it attracts bugs. And then the bugs, you know, fly by the plant, land on the plant, get this sticky stuff all over them, and then they fly away and pollinate. Well, that was by chance. No, that was the hand of God. I mean, here's another illustration of the power of the moon. This is from a little, little uh, critter called a sand hopper. You ever heard, you ever heard of a, that's, that's what they look like. You probably walked over them at the beach all the time. Yeah, they're buried down in the, stand, in the sand. Uh, and if there was no moon, which controlled tidal pools, uh, you know, to bring the water in at certain times and, and it goes out, then these, these, these little creatures wouldn't, wouldn't be able to live. They'd be eaten by predators. But the moon creates tidal action, which allows them to live. Now think about it. These little, these little creatures uh, have a sun compass planted in their little tiny brain. Uh, and then they also have antenna that uh, interact with the moon. So they know in their little tidal pools uh, when it's nighttime and it's time to come out, the sun and the moon, down to this level. And you say you have nothing to thank God for? He's concerned about, is he, well, put it to you this way, is he concern, concerned about a sand hopper? What say you? Yeah. So if he's, if he's concerned about a sand hopper, like Jesus said, are you not much more valuable than a sand hopper? What is? So then that means God is there for you. Therefore, you can say his love endures forever because of how great he is. See, with the moon, we need the moon. Without it, no tides, no currents. The, the marine life would die because the waters would stagnate. Um, many animals and birds wouldn't know how to navigate without the moon. Uh, you know, and without the moon, we'd have extreme weather. I was mowing a lawn one time when I was a kid because I had a little lawn route. And I was used to the desert heat because I grew up there, and it was just hot. It was really hot. And I was used to you know, playing sports in the heat and all that stuff. But this day was really hot. So I decided, I, I can't do this lawn today. And it was 132. That is just not God's will for your life. It was 132. It no, wasn't, wasn't any humidity, but it was blazing hot. Uh, I'm so glad I live in Virginia uh, because it doesn't get up to 132. But, but if there was no moon, I mean, 132 would be kind of like the order of the day because we'd have extreme temperatures. So thank God for all of these things. Uh, and you're thinking, why in the world are we spending so much time talking about the cosmos? Because how little do we thank God specifically for facets of it? I love astronomy. I, I love to read astronomy books. I've got a bunch of books that I uh, dig into. It just, it just blows my mind, the intricacy and complexity of God. You should be pra praising God. So uh, am I a thankful person? And what are the things I would say about my cosmos that I would thank God for? Uh, this week, something amazing happened. Uh, my, one of my uh, childhood heroes, heroes uh, Captain Kirk, actually went into space. He who is the epitome of space flight on the Enterprise had never really been there. Well, he's 90 years old. Do you know that the Jeff Bezos shot him up? This, did, you, did you follow this? It's unbelievable. Uh, so they shoot him up in the, in the rocket, and they, they land in no man's land around Van Horn, Texas. You been there? I've been through there many times. There is not much there. I remember the first time I went through there going from California to Dallas Seminary. Liz had never left the state of California, never seen Texas. We got to Van Horn, that El Paso, Van Horn area. And, and, and from you know, El Paso to Dallas is like 500 miles. <laughs> Liz is like, there's nothing here. This, this is where they landed the capsule after they took off. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a big ride. They spent uh, 10 minutes and 17 seconds. 
Talk about a rocket ride. When they got back and they landed the, 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 the aircraft, uh, they, they interviewed the people as they came out of the capsule. What, did you read what Captain Kirk said? Well, his name is really William Shatner, but you know, in the interview, did you hear what he said? This is really interesting. When they interviewed him, 90-year-old man shot up into space. Imagine the G-force on his body. Here's what he said to Jeff Bezos. He says, um, what you have given me is the most profound experience that I could ever imagine. He then added, I'm filled with so much emotion about what just happened, I, I can hardly talk. Then he says, when you, when you take this rocket ride, he says, you were looking into blackness. I mean, black ugliness. And then you look back down at the blue earth down there, and then the black up in front of you, and you just look back and say, ah, oh, Mother Earth. And then he said, that is life, and that is death. And in that instance, he says, you know, whoa, that's death. That's what I saw. Death. Don't you find that kind of sad in a way? He gets shot out into space, and is, all he sees is the vacuum blackness of space. And I thought to myself, William, you need to read Psalm 136 and ponder this. Because in the blackness and vacuum of space, God has hung all of those stars and planets which show you his greatness. Matthew 13 tells you uh, how great God is when he says this. The Son of Man, Jesus, at the end of time, will send forth his angels. They'll gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks, those who commit lawlessness, and will cast them into a furnace to fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he adds this awesome statement. Then... The righteous will do what? Shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he says, if you have an ear to listen, you better be listening to me. If you come to me in faith and know me, the creator by faith, who died for your sin and rose again. He says, if you know me, there will come the day I will put evil away and righteousness will reign. And when I appear in my glory, he says, you will reflect my glory so brightly it will be as if you are the sun. That's amazing. Thank God for that which is coming, but thank him for what is above you. Uh, and you have, our church is about assignments, correct? What is your assignment? Am I a thankful person? And what exactly about my cosmos would I thank God for? That is, it's, it's mercy, it's his love that I see. Let's pray. God, thank you just for how great you are. We we are in awe of you. How little do our, our finite minds think of your infinite nature uh, and how distracted we become with all the things down here on this planet without really paying attention uh, to all the things uh, through all the specified complexity, all the beauty, all the intricacy, uh, all the simplicity that points to your divine hand. Uh, forgive us for not giving verbal praise and thanks for all of these things. May you receive our thanks for how great you are this day. Amen.